Friends, it's good to be with you. Salamun alaikum. We make sense of the Quran how? That's the question. We have what they call tafsirs. This is, uh, these are the uh, works of previous scholars and contemporary scholars who read the text line by line of the Quran and present you with the meaning that they derive from that text. And that is the most common form of what they call tafsir. Now, in their reading, they will often feel, those who are reading the text through the perspective of hadith, they will require that the hadith be found to read alongside the text. So, for example, if um, the Quran speaks about uh, Subhanallah, the Asra bi Abdihi Laylan, glory, to, glory be to him who took his servant on a nightly journey. If they see that piece of text in the Holy Text, in the Holy Quran, they then reference it through the perspective of a hadith that talks about the nightly journey of the Prophet and how he traveled to the seventh heaven and how he made uh, salah with prayer, you know, with a whole lot of prophets and messengers that have passed away a thousand years before him and how he went up to the seventh heaven. So basically, the text is elaborated, is added on and Whenever you then read that piece of text, you only read it through the hadith. And that is the requirement. That is how they require us to study and understand our holy text. Of course, there are other Mufassirins like uh, um, maybe Sheikh Al-Asi or maybe, uh, you know, Zamakhshari, the famous uh, 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 interpreter who was a linguist. And uh, instead of reading the Quran with a hadith on the side, they looked purely, purely at the grammar, at the sentence construction, at the uh, at the way the you know the verbs and the tenses and and also the, the 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 meaning of the words. So they come in as linguists, and uh, they rely quite heavily on pre-Islamic um, usage of the language. So those are the two types of reading, of deriving the meaning from the Quran that, that, that I'm aware of. Now, if you're a greater expert on tafsirs and so on, please feel free. And then, of course, I mean, I haven't mentioned this, but you can also derive meaning by referencing certain verses at the hand of other verses. So it is, it is and that that is a common um, method um, is using the Quran um, to trans to explain the Quran itself. So, for example, what I've done in deriving meaning is look, for example, at the use of the word salah, and it occurs many, many times in in you know in verb, in past tense, in future, in uh, present tense, to one, to many, plural, singular. So, the word you are really able to use about a hundred occurrences to derive meaning from the word. So, I'm going to drop a word on you called uh, the, uh, the word hermeneutics. And uh, hermeneutics is, a, is the study of the meaning of words. So, if I say salah is more than just a prayer, and somebody else says no, salah is only a ritual prayer, then that is a hermeneutic discussion. You see, we are, we are discussing the meaning of the word. Is if I say a gay person is a happy person, and you say no, a gay person is a homosexual person, we are talking. That is a hermeneutic discussion, right? We are we are play. This is a difference in meaning of the same word. The word has been repurposed to mean something else now, and that is what we maintain. We those who revise, who revise, who are trying to find our way back to the authentic original expression of the deen of Islam, we um, we argue that there, there's, there's been massive repurposing of some of the wording of the Quran. So, after that now, let me, let me come to the actual point of this video. 
one type of meaning that has not been presented to you, which is a contemporary um, methodology for understanding a huge amount of speech or text, is the textual analysis or the discourse analysis. Now, what is a textual analysis? Like, instead of looking at each line and trying to find meaning, a textual analysis or a discourse analysis seeks to identify in summary form the core ideas or the core central precepts or themes that emerge or that are present within a huge body of text. And so what people do today, scholars and researchers, they would do textual analysis on, for example, the news. And there are research, there's, there, there, there are research studies on textual analysis on the news. And when they, when they research the news, Western or let's say BBC news broadcasts, they are able to, from a massive amount of texts, so gathering the evening news over a period of a year, or gathering all the news bulletins over a period of a year of BBC, what they are able to do is extract from that massive amount of text or speech the key positions, the key sentiments, you see, the key um, sort of subliminal um, arguments that are hidden within the text. So they would then discern from analyzing a thousand or a hundred news broadcasts, what they would discern from that is a, a, a finite number of core beliefs, core positions that the BBC will hold. And it will lead them back to the very, very foundational editorial policy of the BBC. Now, let's say, for example, if they, I'm just going to do one example, if they analyze all the news pertaining to the war between, uh, sorry, the assault on the Palestinians, and they won't, well, they won't call it, they won't mention it in those terms. The assault and the um, usurping of the land of Palestine, if they do an analysis of all of those news pieces, what they will come to the conclusion uh, with is that the use of language um, that what the BBC's policy is, is to favor Israel, to advantage Israel, to legitimize the position of Israel, and to delegitimize the position of the Palestinians, but to couch it, to couch that unequal uh, regard, to couch that in terms which, um, which, which pretend to be even-handed. So, and that, that I'm, I'm referring to actual research that has been done. So subliminally, if you analyze the text, the use of the words, the, the, the occurrence of positive words towards one, the occurrence, uh, the, the frequency with which negative connotations are associated with a, with, a, with a second group, that reveals the internal, subliminal, deeply embedded position of the BBC, right? I hope, I hope you find, you've, you've gotten what I'm trying to convince you of, is that you can actually do a deep, do a deep analysis of the text. So instead of, like I said, just looking at the, um, the, the surface reading, like in other words, doing a, a, a dictionary study of the words, the sentences, or looking at a hadith uh, contextual reading, you can also have just a discourse or a, a textual analysis. How does it work? Because I've actually done a textual or a, and a discourse analysis. My, my discourse analysis was um, on uh, colonial, uh, decolonial literature and speeches. And uh, in my case, I analyzed 84, I think, uh, books, speeches, writings, interviews, and all sorts of uh, important um, op 
opinion pieces about decoloniality, right? Uh, in a particular institution. And uh, my aim was to uncover, to reveal the latent, the hidden aspects or the hidden elements, we call it elements of the discourse, the hidden or latent themes <coughs> within that discourse. Uh, in, my, in my research, I make several findings. For example, um, I come up with some serious findings and I also make some important discoveries in um, which 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 I was conferred a doctoral degree for on in that particular. So I'm, I can say that I've done a proper textual textual or discourse analysis. Now, question: What happens when you undertake a discourse analysis on the Holy Quran? What happens when you apply those principles, those methodologies to the Quran? Let me just quickly show you some of the text. This this is this is an excerpt from my. Thesis, and I just want to read. Let me let me let me just give you a bit of hard information about textual and discourse analysis, as explained in the preceding paragraph. The research in, in essentially amounts to an investigation of the experiences, concerns, thoughts, and actions of people via their created text, and from a set of interviews, textual, textual, and from a set of interviews. That's that sentence. Textual analysis has been described as a way for researchers to gather information about how other human beings make sense of the world. Of course, all texts are human, right? We must assume that all texts would be human, but not the Quran, of course. And that is some citations here. Kali 93 says textual analysis as a valuable research methodology in trying to understand and explain social behavior. The wider definition of what constitutes a text has been important. Kali includes the definition of text as interviews, essays, news art, right? Fair Clove adds television and radio broadcasts under the definition of text. For this study, the broadest understanding of the word has been assumed. I'm just showing you that, you know, the, the, that was some of my writing three years ago or four years ago. What happens if we do such an analysis on the Quran? That's the big question. That's the big question. Now, I, after studying um, about a thousand pages of people's speeches, writings, interviews regarding decolonization. I came up with a very finite set of themes. I came up with something like six core themes. Right? Now, I'm not going to go into that now. That's not the purpose here. Uh, you can read my thesis. It's online. Free. So, what... <coughs> What, do, what will you come up when you do that same thing on the Quran? And this is that's the purpose of this video, and that is going to be, the I think, the main outcome of this discussion. You see, long ago, if you read the Quran many, many, many times, if you read the Quran over and over, if you read it cover to cover with understanding, then the core themes, one of, you see, Con completing a textual or a discourse analysis is a cumbersome process. It is a very meticulous process. Every line that you read, you need to assign a certain number of themes to it. Now, let me give you an example. If I read this particular line here, this is how you do a discourse or a textual analysis. I'm, of course, reading the Quran here, chapter 9, verse 23. Chapter 9, verse 23. And I'm going to quickly read the English. And uh, then, technically speaking, the discourse analysis should be done by through the Arabic. But if you are ca capable of understanding the, the vocabulary, the wording there, uh, you, 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 you have a, in a, you're in a position to, to, to extract the, the themes, right? So by reading the entire book, the entire Mus'haf, you will 
you will be able to identify the various themes. But you need to look for a specific, there needs to be an objective. Now, if I say my objective is I want to understand what are the core foundational assumptions within Islam, within the Quran, what are the very, very core foundational positions? Like, when, you know, when you, when you do a discourse analysis on Christianity, you, 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 you arrive after reading the texts and listening to the sermons um, and understanding the religion, if you gain serious insight, what you will find is that Christianity really comes down to approximately maybe five or six core principles or core ideas. One of those will be um, the importance of grace. Right? Grace. What is grace? Grace means um, being kind in spite of your um, over trespasses or your you know, your, your, your crimes and your uh, transgressions. So in other words, grace is when you come as a sinner, but you still hope that God will admit you to paradise. So a very core assumption within Christianity is that man is a sinner, but that he hopes through the um, admission or to, through the recognition that Jesus has died for you, that you will receive grace, right? You will be forgiven. That is a core foundational idea within Christianity. When you hear the priests and the pastors and the bishops and the popes speak, you always have to understand that that governs their religious understanding, is that God will overlook a certain level of um, trespassing on his people. And so you will also find their philosophy, their outlook on life shaped by that one principle. You know, Christians are more forgiving. They are more overlooking. They are less judgmental than Muslims. I know that for a fact, believe me. They might, they, you, you'll get judgmental Christians, but that is more under influence of the Judeo uh, tradition nowadays. Because Judaism is exactly the opposite, completely unforgiving. And because if you can reduce Judaism to one word or to one concept, then it is hard justice. <laughs> hard justice. Judaism is a religion of hard justice. You only get what you deserve. And that is maybe why, I don't, I don't know, if it's, it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but that's maybe why Jews are very independent, because they believe you get what you deserve. Um, I mean, that, I'm just trying to make you understand what I mean by extracting the core themes. What do we get when we do this to the Quran? What are the core themes of the Quran? And for us as people who regard the Quran as the sole divine text that is preserved, Hadith is not a divine text. But we have that strong position here. What emerges? I'm going to share with you what I see emerging with my reading of the Quran, with my understanding of the Quran, with me doing a word cloud, because I did that once, if you look previously, one of the early videos is a word cloud. Obviously, in a word cloud, you'll see the most commonly used words. And I'm going to share with you finally, what are the five core precepts, core ideas, core concepts that emerge from the text. Here we go. Number one. Number one. The number one concept that emerges if you read the Quran constantly, cover to cover, the number one idea that emerges is that God is supreme, all-powerful, intelligent, and this, the, the, the understanding that God is absolutely beyond anything that we can imagine. So we only know God by what we see of his behavior uh, or, or the effects of his, his decisions. 
And the effects of his decisions give us an indication of what the being called God or Allah or Ar-Rahman, what that being is like. We can draw conclusions. And from the text, if you read it enough, you will gain the insight that that creative force, that master, that supreme Lord is gentle, kind, helpful, loving, but also majestic, powerful, and um, supremely, supremely in control. So that is the first idea that we get. That's number one, four to go. That I will summarize all of that in the word Tawheed, Tawahud, Tawheed, making God one and supreme. So it is an, an, a view and understanding of God that is absolutely monotheistic and also an understanding of God that transcends anything that resembles from what is what we have as familiar. Right. Number two, the second theme that emerges, if you apply this critic or this discourse analysis or textual analysis, the second uh, idea that emerges is that God reaches out via messengers. God reaches out via messengers. So he is there, he's supreme, he's all-powerful, he's nurturing, he's loving, but he makes contact. He makes contact with us. Right? And remember the discourse analysis looks at the discourse in terms of its social implications. So the second uh, core principle that we read from the text, and if you read it enough times, you'll see every story of Abraham, every story of Moses, every reflection of Muhammad alayhi salam, is about him reaching out to us, warning us, giving us glad news, guiding us. So the second important writing for us, recording for us, a message, you know, the Quran itself, the text, the Mus'haf. So the second theme is the bridge, that God maintains a bridge with humanity. There is a communication bridge between God and humanity. That's the second theme. The third theme, if you read the Quran enough times, the second theme, or the third one that you read, if you read the Quran enough times, is that there is a God, number one. He reaches out with guidance and warning. And I will call the second one uh, Risala. Or Nubuwa. It is the no, the word Nubuwa, Nabi, comes from information, informing. So Nubuwa means, there is, firstly, there is a God. I'll call that Tawheed. Second one, there is an attempt to reach out, to warn us. That is called Nubuwa. It means informing us, giving us warning. Now the third one, the third one is that you are accountable for your actions. So the third one is that the, th the next theme, if you read the Quran enough times, you will find that the Quran emphasizes that the doer of good will be rewarded and the committer of evil shall suffer the consequences. So in other words, the whole idea of accountability is intrinsic as a core principle. The idea of if you do good, you are rewarded. If you if you mess up and you oppress or you harm or you cause damage, you are will be suffer. So in other words, you are accountable for your actions. But it makes sense because if you had nubuwa, if you had the warning and you have the guidance, then the accountability is important. Can you see how it makes sense? The, the, there's a logical flow. And I will call that sense of account and also of course all the Quran's terrifying visions of the end of time the 
the destruction of the world, the end of empires, how the world will one day end, the, the appearance in front of the supreme judge, Yawmul Qiyamah, Yawmul Deen, Yawmul Hisab, all of these ideas are part of this theme of accountability. Accountability on earth as well as accountability in the next life. So that is the, and, and, and even the idea of reward, being rewarded in the next life is part of that accountability system. There lies for you a supreme reward if this life is conducted in accordance with the beautiful wishes and requirements of the divine. So I'll call that ma'ad, ma'ad, which is coming back, facing God. Tawheed. You know what that is. Nubuwa, you know what that is. Ma'ad, you know what that is. Now there's another theme that comes out. There's another theme now, the fourth one. And that is the theme of compassion, fairness, on this fairness, compassion, and social responsibility. Social responsibility, compassion, and fairness. The Quran, if you read it enough times, you will come to no other conclusion that to be fair, to be compassionate, to be helpful, to help the one who is in dire straits, to come to the rescue of the oppressed and to confront the oppressor is a core requirement in the Quran. No doubt, no doubt. And so it goes back to a bigger understanding of harmony and uh, uh, peace and equilibrium in the universe. So the Quran calls for that equilibrium to be maintained. So we as social creatures, Tawheed is there, God exists, number two, uh, Nubuwa is there, the warning exists via the messengers. Number three, accountability exists, is very core. And number four, social responsibility, justice and fairness is an essential part of God's greater plan. And I will call that the Arabic word Adl, Adl, Adl. And then the fourth key feature, oh sorry, the fifth, right? So it's Tawheed, Nubuwa, Ma'ad, Adl. Now we come to the final of the five core themes that I can extract, extract by reading the Quran enough times. You cannot come to any other conclusion. And the fifth one, and I can't find the sixth one, right? The fifth, fifth one is simply the idea of of, um, sorry, I had Ma'ad, I had Tawheed, um, Nubuwa, Ma'ad, Adl. Right. The fourth one is Wilayat. What is Wilayat? What, what is Wilayat? Wilayat is the idea of leadership. The idea of establishing infrastructure. The idea of creating a system. And the verses that speak about that would be the verses that refer to Abraham, to Moses, to Muhammad alayhi salam, where they have to establish communities. They have to establish inna awwala bayti wudi alinas lalladhi bibakka bibakka tamubar. You see, that particular verse says the first house established for the benefit of mankind is the one at Bakka, blessed Bakka. So the, the idea of Wilayat is that there has to be systemization. There has to be systemization. So the, 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 the verses that speak, as I said, about the prophet organizing the people, structuring their communities, creating institutions, creating policies, creating order. That is very, very much part of the Quran. 
and the Quran will, uh, where, where, where will you fit a concept like Salah in? You see, institutionalization of Salah is creating a, 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 a pattern, a, a community, a com in, in Western civilization, or in our contemporary modern world, I would say that uh, Wilayat is akin to the idea of a um, state, of a state, of creating a state. A state is not a land, a state is not a country. The word state means a regime, a, a, a state of being. It is how we are, how we exist, how we live. Now, the American, uh, United States of America, regards a state as a, as a particular territory, right? And uh, in the rest of the world, they would see the whole country as being a state. It means the way we govern ourselves. So the idea of wilaya is the idea of governance and state formation. And that is pretty much, if we look at what, the, what happened in Medina when the Prophet migrated from Makkah to Medina, it is the formal institution of the idea of a state, of wilaya. Now, the, it's interesting, but the, the, American, uh, uh, the uh, American name uh, is, is called uh, Wilayatul Mutahida, the United States. Wilayatul Mutahida. That is the Arabic name. So it's interesting that the word Wilayat means state, right? It means state. And in that sense, um, uh, Wilayatul Mutahida. So Wilayat and the United States is called the United States, is, is, is a state. And of course, with a state comes governance and leadership. And we lie at, it is very important as a core principle that leadership has to be a key issue within Islam. Now the Quran, <coughs> although the Sunnis or, or traditional Islam has kicked out the idea of we lie at, because the kings have eliminated that concept, you see, we lie, it is very central. We lie, it means, The Quran says, whoever does not govern by that which God has revealed, such are rejecters. So all these people that have ruled over the years, the Muslim lands, and have not lived by the Spirit and the guidance of the Quran, they've been the rejecters. They've been kafirun, kafirun. So governance is an essential part of wilayat, and governance can only be by means of the Qur'an. So what am I saying to you? This is also, you see, the Qur'anists are speaking to you, and they are playing games. Many of them are playing games with meaning of words, and they're taking you to the stratosphere with uh, party near interpretations and finding fancy for weird meanings in the Qur'an. What I'm applying for you is, besides the reading the lines is extracting the deep core meanings. But now I'm going to give you the... You see, that is my reading of the Quran. That is my investigation of the Quran. It is my textual analysis, my discourse analysis. Now you can... Uh, I'm not talking about the practices. I'm talking about the core doctrines, right? The core doctrines. If you want to analyze the Quran in terms of rituals or practices, there are many others, commandments. For example, you would find uh, uh, reoccurring themes would be um, being charitable, right? But or a reoccurring theme would be to um, be responsible or uh, uh, displaying a, me a, a measure of restraint, taqwa, right? So let me let me drop the final one on you. You see what is so deeply inspiring for me is when I, 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 these, these are the core precepts of the Quran, the five core precepts. They, they, they 100% align with the precepts that the very early Quran enthusiasts, the Quran students, which precede Sunnism, before there was Sunnism, they were just Quran. And the, and the scholars of the time, the scholars like Imam Zaid, like Imam Jafar Sadiq, the early scholars, the scholars that were dissidents, that were kicked out of the community, the family of the Prophet, these are the same usul or foundational principles 
which Jafar Sadiq, Zayed, um, and all these people adhered to. So, bottom line, what I'm saying to you is, and the next video will go into much greater detail here, is that I'm saying to you, if you've seen a, an affinity with my work with, with the Ahlul Bayt, like Imam Muzaid or Imam Hussein or Imam Ali or as a section of the Sahabi, as a broader group of Sahabi and those who stood with him, then you must understand it is because I regard them as holding true to the core precepts of the Quran. These five Usuluddin are the same Usuluddin that you will get in any madrasa in Yemen, in a Zaidi madrasa. The five Usuluddin. I mean, I can show it to you. Let me um, show you a book that um, I authored, or, or sorry, edited, not authored, um, many, many years ago. Um, and um, I will I will point you to, I mean, maybe we should just look at the, the index of this book. And as you can see, the, the book, which is a summary, a, a high scholar, a high work of scholarship, relates the important elements of the, the core precepts. And it actually lists those same points that I've just mentioned to you. And um, if you join the Telegram channel, um, if you would like to, you know, get copies of my books and my works, um, you you're very free to uh, somewhere there on on the um, YouTube YouTube homepage. There's a Telegram channel um, link and. Um, I, I'm, I'm able to share with people who are with me on Telegram um, these books that uh, that you can have access to also. So I'm going to conclude on that note what I've been talking to you for the past um, 40 minutes or 35 minutes is that a textual analysis or a discourse analysis is something that brings out the latent themes from a huge work of text or speech. And um, it's, a, it's, it's an additional method of understanding the Holy Quran. And that a quick and sort of a preliminary textual analysis that I've do, done on the Quran by reading, just by reading it for many, many years, has resulted in five core doctrinal themes that emerge. And those themes, amazingly, overlap or agree almost with the Quranic rationalists of early, early, early Islam. Imam Zaid is credited with the oldest book in existence, Imam Zaid, and it agrees to some, to a very high degree, almost perfectly, with what he finds to be the core doctrines within Islam. Those five are Tawheed, Nubuwa, Ma'ad, Adl, and Wilaya. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.